Thank you for your blessings in our lives. Stand on heaven. 
every promise we're not afraid our faith goes before us when we believe we're gonna see the supernatural Oh, oh, oh. 
stand on every word, God. We believe every word. Hallelujah. On your way to your seat, grab somebody, hug their neck, shake their hands, and say, I am standing on his promises. Good morning, Freedom Center. Everybody doing great? Amen? Amen. Well, before, uh, I think last week, uh, Pastor Greg called these silly messages. So before I get to the silly messages, uh, you don't remember that, all right. I wanted to uh, take a second. Uh, some of you know my wife is... Uh, been in the hospital with a with a growth on her uh, her right lung that uh, was removed successfully and uh, hallelujah so you know I was I was thinking I know the uh, the church and a number of you folks have been praying for her and uh, I, I just cannot imagine somebody going through something like this without the prayers of the Saints amen so, thank you very much. She'll probably be getting out uh, Monday, Tuesday, something, but uh, we certainly appreciate the prayers of each and every one of you. Thank you. Amen. Okay. The uh, youth will have a car wash. Yeah, yeah, this Saturday. Everybody here has got a dirty car. They need to bring it Saturday at 10 o'clock for the youth to wash. That'll be 10 to 1 this Saturday. This is for raising money for their uh, upcoming trip to Christ for the Nations? Yeah. Oh. Amen. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know where it is. <laughs> oh, the car wash is out front. Yeah. <laughs> I thought you meant worse, Christ for the Nations. I'm not as, quite as sharp as I thought I was, am I? Okay. Also, the youth will be having uh, Friday Night Live. That'll be uh, May 24th coming up. And as far as coming up the uh, neat events, we've got Calvin Noel coming in for a free concert. That's uh, the last part of June. So, also, if you are a first or second time visitor, would you please stand up and uh, let us recognize you? Hey, wow, wow. Stay standing, stay standing. Stay standing, please. We've got all kinds of gifts to shower you with. Man, that, that, I think this is the biggest visitor group we've had. I, it probably has nothing to do with the fact that John Paul Jackson's here, right? Well, thank you all for coming. Wow, that's great. Hallelujah. Please be seated. Thank you. Also, we have a new member, Reginald, better known as Reggie Hicks. Reggie, would you stand up? Wherever he is. All right. There he is. Say hi to Reggie. Praise the Lord. Well, we have water baptism this morning. Give Jesus a hand. Amen. Everyone that's going to be water baptized. You know, uh, under the Old Testament, Old Covenant, uh, circumcision was a mark of the covenant. Under the New Covenant, 
we have water baptism. Water baptism means that I am crucified with Jesus Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And this morning, before witnesses, before heaven, and before witnesses in this body, they are testifying that Jesus Christ is their Lord and their Savior. So we're going to baptize Pamela Williams first. Pamela, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Yes, I have. Then, my sister, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Next up, we have Anisha Williams. Anisha, have you accepted Christ to be your Lord and Savior? Then in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I baptize you. Next, we have Andre Marie Jean. Andre Murray, have you accepted Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior? Then in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, I baptize you. Give Jesus one more hand. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Michael Parks, where you at? Come on up here. Michael has been dying to share something with the, the body. And uh, <laughs> and last week was so unusual, and it just didn't occur. And I don't remember what happened the week before. <laughs> but today is the day. Yeah. Amen. Here. Okay. So uh, as you know, my name is Michael Parks. Um, and I wanted to speak to y'all because uh, um, I have been sober a year as of April 14th this year. And time felon. I'm on probation right now, and um, I went to an awesome six-month rehab in Harris County Jail. It's called New Choices. Um, I've done my outpatient, um, cleared all my DAs, um, had a year to go on my probation, and I want to let anybody out there know that if you're suffering right now, there is a way out. There is a way out. I'm just looking at my Bible, and my favorite Bible verses is um, Isaiah 51:17. that says the, the two greatest sacrifices you can make to God is a, a broken spirit and a contrite heart, or contrite spirit and a broken heart. And uh, um, uh, when I was in, um, I did nine months this last time in Harris County, and um, before I went into the rehab treatment program, um, it was right before I was like, I'm ready to go in this program and get out of jail. But um, right before I went into to the treatment center, um, I, I was with God one night after, you know, rack time, and uh, um, I was like, God, I go, I can't do this. I didn't say I need your help. I said, I can't do this. Hmm. I just totally surrendered and said, you know what, you're going to have to do this rehab for me because I can't do it myself. I'm just tired. So that was what I wanted to share 
with you. So if there's anybody out there suffering today, don't suffer in silence. Get some help. There is help out there. Don't leave. I mean, if, if we would have put this off one more week, you know, it would have been beautiful on Mother's Day to put, put uh, because you talk about the prayers of a praying mother. Thank you, mothers that pray. And if, it, if it's any message to mamas, don't stop praying and keep believing. Anybody who's, anybody who's recovered has recovered because somebody somewhere out there has been praying for them. Amen. That's right. That's it. And I think the Lord's been stirring that in us as a body more and more and more of uh, getting rid of the stronghold of prayerlessness and committing ourselves to praying and naming them one by one. And you're going to find that you don't have enough time to pray. You're going to have to set aside time to pray daily. And then once you start doing it, you just start seeing the Lord move. And it's amazing. And one of the prayers that was easy to see the Lord take care of was uh, Monday. We were as a staff, and again, I will tell you that as you fill out those prayer requests, we pray for every one of those prayer requests. Let's, let's back it up, though. I, I was in Celebrate Recovery is now over for the, the, the year or for the season, but I, I was in Celebrate Recovery, which is here at the church, and it's an awesome you know, group program to be in. And last Sunday was our last uh, session, and I told uh, Toya Baskin, I was like, you know, if there's anybody you know that's in the church that has an old bike that they um, would like to, you know, don't want anymore, I, I need a bike. Because I have, I have trouble walking, but getting on a bicycle and pushing pedals is, you know, so much easier. And it's not, not you know, stress on the joints. And so she's like, okay, well, I'll, you know, take it to, you know, the elders or whatever on Monday. And so I get a message on Monday on Facebook, and I'll let you you'll finish. Well, I just said before Tori could finish the statement, I said, Evan's answered. We can check that one off our list. Amen. So, Tracy. Pray about that. I'm not going to ride it around the, the sanctuary. Yeah, no, no, no. There's a story to this bike. Yeah, there's a little story. When I went to Walmart to pick up the bike, um, I, I was just standing there talking. This guy was giving me bike information about the size of the wheels and all that. He, You're too tall for that bike. He says, not for me. It's for a church member. Is he shorter? He wanted to know his height and weight and all that. And he gave me the details. And he said, no, I, I'm sensing in the Holy Spirit that's the right bike. And then he began to tell me about his story. He was trying to lose 100 pounds. And he had been on the Daniels fast for 60 days. He'd lost 18 or so pounds. And I encouraged him and I asked him, will you mind if I pray for you? Uh, I laid my hands on him, prayed for him. And he said, I'm sensing I need to pray for this bike. He, in, the, in Walmart, in the bike section, we took up the whole aisle. He laid his hands on this bike and he began to pray. And he asked that the Holy Spirit would touch this bike, that this bike would go all over the town, spreading and carrying the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he anointed it. And we agreed in prayer, and it's done. <laughs> Amen. God is awesome. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Love you. Um, we're about to continue into worship. And I think if one thing that I've been sharing with families on the go, that's what I'm doing. Um, is that you know, our silly announcements, it, everything that we do is seamless. Even our announcements are a part of worship because we're trying to tell you here's places where you can serve. Here's places where you can sacrifice your time. Here's places where you can use your gift. Here's how you can be connected to the body. And if I'm not mistaken, that would be worship. And uh, so everything that we do is worship. Prayer is worship. I, prayer is probably one of the highest forms of, of prayer that we could do is in worship. It just it happens to be accompanied with uh, rhythm, melody, and instruments. But you're worshiping. You're telling the Lord how, how worthy he is. You're, you're telling him of his worth. And also what you should be doing is interceding. And I want you to, as we enter back into worship, I want you to intercede for a little girl named Samantha. We've been praying for Samantha, and I want you as a body. I know the parents are probably watching right now, streaming, and, 
She was, uh, had to stay in the hospital last night with a fever. She's had some side effects of her chemo. And uh, we just want to see God just remove that cancer and heal her. And so I'm asking you as a body, as you worship today, intercede for Samantha as you worship. Why don't you stand?
Father, we worship you. We declare your goodness.
Father, we thank you how much you love us. Father, we, we wouldn't even know love apart from you, Lord God. Lord, the simplest verse, that for God so loved the world. Thank you, Father God. And thank you that you love us so much, Lord, that you, you even care about every detail of our lives. And Lord, that you are concerned with everything. And Lord, that you are wanting and waiting, Father, just as we talked about prayer, you're waiting. You're waiting to unfold things in our lives. Lord, let us press into you. Let us press into you to know you deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper of loving you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Why don't you be seated? Oh, it's time to uh, continue with our worship with our tithes and offerings. Amen. This is a, a place where we can uh, uh, demonstrate to God that we recognize that all belongs to him. It, uh, we are just stewards. What he, what he gives us is actually just entrusted to us uh, uh, to work and, and to fulfill the, the things and the will that he has in our lives. Amen. If you're giving by cash this morning, you can uh, raise your hand and the uh, ushers have envelopes so we can make record of your giving. Uh, if you've forgotten your checkbook, you can uh, uh, give online through uh, uh, PayPal on our website. Uh, we have an account set up, so you can honor God. God gets the glory either way, no matter how you get the resources to him. Uh, I want to give you an update on the bridge also. We've had a phenomenal week. We're up over $60,000 that God's blessed us with toward the project. Amen. And we're getting very close to, to breaking ground. We have uh, we've got a few last little details we've got to put on the drainage for the ball fields, but that should be resolved here in the next uh, week or two, and we'll be breaking ground there soon after. And Pastor Tracy will be heading off with a bunch of programs this fall. Amen. Oh, let's pray today. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we just thank you for this opportunity to demonstrate uh, through worship with our finances, Lord, uh, to <clears throat> sow tithes and offerings, Lord. For your glory, Lord, we pray that you bless each and every person here. Open up the windows of heaven so that blessings overflow upon them as they give unto you and to, to your purposes, Lord. We thank you and give, give the glory to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. See the Lord high and lifted up, seated on the throne of my life. Say with me. I see the Lord high and lifted up, seated on the throne of my life. And you are
are so glad this morning to have John Paul Jackson with us. We had a, we didn't make reservations last night, and uh, we thought we'd go to the Burning Pear. We always do that, and they weren't open. <laughs> so we walked over to Perry Steakhouse, and they were full, no room at the end. And uh, then we went to uh, P.F. Chang's, and I didn't want to wait. <laughs> and wound up at Zoe's. <laughs> but I think it's where we were supposed to be. Just a, a laid-back, comfortable time of just uh, sharing hearts. And uh, we, could, we, we could have stayed there all night, but we, we couldn't do that to him. And uh, just so excited what the Lord has for us today. And I believe that the word that the Lord has placed upon uh, John Paul's heart today is exactly, we were praying, John, it would be a customized word for our body. So uh, we welcome you. Everybody welcome John Paul Jackson. My goodness, what a great worship, and baptism, oh my goodness. Uh, baptism is, is much more powerful than we think. We sometimes make it less, less powerful maybe. maybe, maybe that's not the right word, but um, you know, one of the, one of the things I've, I don't hear talked about, but, but it's uh, it's really true, and I don't know why I'm supposed to say this, but I feel I am, um, is that the ancient Hebrews saw this earth as a womb. And as we're, as we're in our mother and we, we come out into a whole world, that we leave this world and we come out into another whole world, an everlasting world. We enter into a world that's eternal, and in that entering, they... Uh, saw that that's where life really began, it was in that, that, what we might call the afterlife, or in, in that resurrected life. And one of the signs they saw of that, and they, they took that in the, the brazen labor, was the breaking of the water. When the first thing that happens when a mother's getting ready to deliver a child is, is there's a, a, the water breaks. And in baptism, the water breaks. And you are birthed into as evidence of a whole new life, a promise of that which is going to be everlasting to us. And so uh, whenever I see that happen, I realize that this is far different than what we, we typically think of. It's much more than what we typically think of. It's just a, a renewed vow before the Lord, an evidence of the washing away of the old man, a passing through from one life into another life. But it's actually the thing. It's the, the evidence of a birthing and the statement of a birthing into a, a great, incredible life in him. Um, I'm really glad to be with you today. I count it a joy to be here. I don't know why you guys make me feel so welcome, but you do. And so I feel almost like I'm home, speaking to my home church or something. And so it's, very, it's a very endearing feeling. Don't change that. Treat me nice always. <laughs> But you, you really do, and I'm, I'm very, very grateful, very grateful for that. I want to talk to you today about a message called Power and Authority, but before I do, I just want to give away two things. Uh, uh, I don't think I've, I've given these two products away. I don't think I ever have, but I, I probably should have because they're, they're both very unique. The first one that I want to give away is called The Interaction Between Heaven and Earth. Now, this particular DVD uh, I made, uh, and it was because God put it on my heart that we do not understand the value of, that he places on earth, in this earth, in this creation. We're not to worship it at all, but it is meant to help us get to where we're going. And there's a reason why in Revelation 11:18 it ends with the last part of that verse that says, and the Lord said, Come, let us go down and destroy those who destroy the earth. That tells me God puts great value on this earth. 
And too often we, we believers don't understand how the earth was designed to help us. Why in Romans chapter 8, Paul said the earth groans in futility because we're not taking our rightful place. And what it would mean for that to happen. If we really did what we're called to do, there wouldn't be droughts, there wouldn't be famines, there wouldn't be earthquakes, there wouldn't be pestilence, etc. The earth would totally respond to our presence. And so, as we approach righteousness, as we grow in righteousness, not our righteousness, but seeking first his righteousness, then that takes place. So, you might enjoy some of the insights that the Lord has given me on this particular topic. So, uh, if you're in the back two rows, first person up here on the back two rows, or all right, come, come hither, quickly, quickly. It's right there. Um, I had an unusual experience when, uh, in a number of years back, I wasn't expecting it. I I didn't think that I, I deserved it for sure. I didn't think I didn't think I'd fasted enough, hadn't prayed enough, wasn't holy enough, nothing enough. And I had this experience where literally. Like Paul wrote, I knew a man once, and such a man was caught up into the third heaven. Whether in the flesh or in the spirit, I do not know, but he was caught up into the third heaven. And in this particular moment, I heard a harp play, a strum of a harp, very loud. And the next thing I know, I'm standing in what I later would find out, and I won't go through the whole story, but I would later find out was I was in the throne room. And I was beholding the Lord sitting on his throne. And it scared me. Oh, my goodness. It was so, so scary. I'm going to read you a passage. I hadn't planned on doing this, but again, I just feel like I should. Get out my glasses because time evaporates the size of words. I don't know why that happens, but it's like they evaporate. They just get smaller. Creativity speaks something from nothing because it involves dependency on the Spirit. The act of creating in all its varying forms can be worship at a level currently beyond human comprehension. Even if you've never actually finished writing a poem sculpting a piece, or painting the canvas, the boundaries between human and the celestial have been crossed with a single line of worship. In just a moment, all dimensions of spirit and life converge when that happens. Dependency on the Spirit of God not only requires trust, but is trust. True creativity is solely dependent on the one who could never create or dream up unless the uncreated one reaches down and touches you. It injects us with revelation. It takes nothing and turns it into something. And without it, nothing will ever be formed. The painting will not appear on the canvas. The haka will not appear from the end of our pen. Every drop of our creative ability comes from him. Having been in God's throne room, I've seen creativity in its finest form. Creativity that embodies true, complete, full worship. I love artistic things. I love color, densities, textures. I love all these things because I saw them there. The place where he dwells is moving, living, breathing creativity. I felt like I needed to write something about that moment. I haven't ever told the fullness of that story, but I've told excerpts, and in this book, Seven Days Behind the Veil, 
I wrote about that moment. And, uh, and so I just feel like, is there anybody who has a birthday today? Come Heather. I just felt like I needed to give it to somebody that had a birthday today. So God must have wanted this for you. God bless you. Thank you. Okay, if you turn in your Bibles with me to Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, verse 32 and verse 36. Father, help me communicate what you want these people to know, and may it draw them closer to you. And bless the reading of your word, I pray, in Jesus' name. Uh, I'm going to begin at verse 31, actually. Then he went down to Capernaum, or Capernaum, depending on where you were educated, went down to Capernaum and a city of Galilee, or a city of Galilee, and was teaching them on the Sabbaths. And they were astonished at his teaching, for his word was with authority. Verse 36, then they were all amazed and spoke among themselves, saying, what a word is this, or this is, for with authority and power he commands the unclean spirits, and they come out. There's two things that people marveled at with Jesus. It wasn't his looks. It wasn't his strength like Samson. It was authority and power. Now today, we think a lot about power. And we've, we've looked for it. We've asked for it. And I, I for a number of years, would, be, would pray for people and I would say, for power, Lord. More power, more power, give us more power. But then I began to wonder why I wasn't seeing more power. I mean, God's still God, and he's still, he's still having nothing. He hasn't changed one lick. So what is it about it? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm living close to God. I'm living in repentance. I address the things God is addressing in my life. I'm not perfect, but at least I'm working on the things that God's working on. I'm agreeing with him. I need to work on those things. I'm, I'm praying. I'm reading his word. So what is, what is going on here? And I began to inquire of the Lord. I began to, to wonder what was, why certain things weren't happening. And why, like, I would walk into grocery stores and demons weren't shrinking, shrieking. I would go down, I would meet people and demons were shrieking. And I'm, I mean, I'm smart enough to know that, that either, either demons left or, or they're not bothered by me. It's like when I come by them, they're not going, ah! And they should be if they're there. They did the Jesus. They recognized that, that Jesus was the Son of God. And, and it, wasn't that, it wasn't that he was, he was God. It was because he was fully man. But something else they recognized in him. And what is that something? Because I want to find that something. Because he said, greater things than I do, you shall do, because I go to the Father and, and intercede for you. So I want to know, what is it that's going to take to get this stuff to happen? And I began to look, and I began to ask, and I began to pray, Lord, what is it? And he gave me a dream. Strange dream. In this dream, I was, I was standing kind of like this. I was up in the air in a church, kind of looking as if, as if I was peering into something that was happening. And I'm watching people come in, and they, they look like they have backpacks, little backpacks all on their back. But as I looked closer, I realized they weren't backpacks. They were demons grabbed to hold their shoulders and hanging on. And people would pray. And they weren't even bothered. People would come down front to be prayed for, didn't bother the demons a bit. And I go, how could this be? How could this be? And the Lord simply said to me, 
Demons aren't afraid of power, but they are very afraid of authority. And it took me on a journey that I've been on for a long time. And just recently, the Lord allowed me to put it together. And it stems from these verses that I just wrote you in Luke chapter 4, read to you in Luke chapter 4. They were astonished. The people were astonished. I mean, I've, I've been astonished before, but it's something so unusual. It's something so clear, something that's happening that is something right in front of me. And I go, I've never seen that before. And that's what was going on with the people as they watched Jesus. They'd never seen authority before. They hadn't seen power before either. Today we'll occasionally see, see something happen, people are healed, and, and really that's really wonderful, but there's got to be a greater understanding, because it's not, Jesus didn't just say it would be sprinkled to you periodically, once in a while, upon occasion. He wants us to live a life that is really full of, well, where we ate last night, Zoe. Well, not full of that kitchen, but full of Zoe life, that Greek word that means a homeostasis of spirit, soul, and body, a balance of spirit, soul, and body where the spirit is in control and it is led by the spirit of God. That's a Zoe life. And so he wants us to have that Zoe life, but we're, we're really content not to. And part of it is we don't understand, and part of it is we, we don't know what it takes. So let's take a, a look at those two words that we find in Scripture, Luke chapter 4 and, and elsewhere. The word for power is the Greek word dunamis. It's the root word we get uh, dynamite from. So it's very, it's very explosive. It takes things and changes them. It is creative. It's disheveling. It's the miraculous. It's the supernatural. It, it it takes the physical world and alters it. And then there's the, the, the Greek word exousia. And exousia is the word that is used for authority. It is the, it's judicial control. It is when you speak it, it happens. You make a sentence, you decree it, it takes place. That's, that's authority. Even, even in the Lord's Prayer, we see an example of this type of, of thought, and that is it finishes up by, yours is the kingdom, yours is the power, yours is the glory forever. See, what we find is that kings ruled the kingdom by authority, but they conquered with power. They conquered with power. Jesus sent his disciples, in Matthew, Matthew 10, out into the world, and he gave them power. Starting to conquer. And said, when this happens, tell them the kingdom has come near you. When you raise the dead, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, tell them the kingdom has come near you. Maybe the easiest way to begin our understanding of the difference between authority and power is to take a look at what healing and miracles actually are. Now, this may surprise you. I was raised, not, not what I'm about to tell you, but what I'm going to, what uh, the definition may surprise you. Because I, I was raised, and maybe many of you were raised like me, if you're, especially if you're raised in church, you came to the understanding of perhaps, or perhaps you came to this understanding. That is this, that healing takes time, but miracles are instant. I was taught that all my life. The problem is, when I look in Scripture, it's not true. Jesus healed instantly. I mean, it's like, it didn't take five years for the guy to get healed. He healed instantly. They were healed. So I thought, wait a minute. How does healing take time equate to instant healing? So that, that can't be the definition. And miracles, yeah, miracles were instant too. But both healings and miracles were instant. So it, it can't be a time issue. What makes healing significant and miracles significant can't be a time-based issue. So I literally have gone through and done a study of every single instance and every single word used when it was, whether Jesus healed them, was it that he touched them? No, that wasn't the case because sometimes he touched and they were healed and sometimes he didn't touch and they were healed. Sometimes he spoke the word and they were healed. Sometimes he spit and they were healed. 
So this is a strange world here. So I said, what is it? What is, what is the difference between healings and miracles? And here's what I saw. And it's so clear, and it's true in every case. And it's this. Power is what makes limbs grow out. It makes eyes be recreated. See, power is the miraculous. Miraculous. Something that didn't exist now exists. Something that wasn't working now is working. Something that was crooked is now made straight. That's the miraculous. It recreates. It regenerates. Healing, in every case, healing is the, is the removal of something. It may be the removal of a demon. Because casting out demons was literally called, and they were healed. It may be, it may be the removal of a germ, a spirit of affliction. It may be an infirmity. It may be bacteria. It may be a virus in our current common, in our, our understanding of what, what that is. But it's always the removal of something. In every case, it is removing something from the person. Now, in a lot of cases, it was both. It was the removing of one issue and the recreation in another, another issue. For example, the lepers that were healed. There were 10 lepers that were healed. One came back to thank Jesus. He was healed. No more leprosy. But see, leprosy eats away the flesh. It eats away digits that are on your hand or, or your nose or your ears. It, it, it eats away body parts. And so you can be healed of leprosy, but still be missing your finger. Does that make sense? But there's one that came back. And something changed with the one that came back. He not only was healed, it says he was made whole. The digit that was eaten away was replaced. Healing was the removal of the leprosy. The miracle was the replacement of the finger or the nose, or the ears, or whatever was eaten away, it was now, he was whole. Nothing was missing in him. That's the miraculous. Sometimes it takes both. Sometimes we can ask God, remove the, the cancer. He removes the cancer, but the kidney still doesn't work. And so we have the miraculous regenerates, recreates the kidney, so it's now working. So you have both issues that need, that need to be focused on. Power is that dunamis, it is a miraculous, and it is creative in nature. It's a very issue that hovered over Mary, and the angel said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the dunamis, the power of the Most High, will overshadow you. And she conceived and bore a son, Jesus. It's creative, dunamis, life-altering power. But authority, authority is different. You conquer with, with power, but you rule with authority. And the right hand is a declaration, go forth, conquer, send the army out, go do it. Left hand is the scepter, authority. It establishes the groundwork. It establishes the rule. It's the scepter that ruled the kingdom. It's what said, build the highway, build the building. It is what set in order the laws of the land the scepter did. And authority, again, is the Greek word exousia. It's healing. It's commanding the demons to leave, and they leave. That's why healing is the removal of something. Demons were removed. But see, authority is not just, the, is not just seen in removal. It's seen in what happens when you say be removed or stop. Jesus said to the wind and the waves, in Matthew 8, peace be still. He spoke, and it said, and the disciples go, what kind of guy is this? Who is this guy? Or in your Bible, it's going to say, what manner of man is this? <laughs> Who is this guy? He speaks to the wind and waves, and they obey. You see, you obey authority. He had authority over the wind and waves. We too often 
try to use power where authority is needed. Because we think they're the same thing. We think authority and power are the same, and they're not the same. The disciples were given power, but then they encountered a power that was even greater. And the disciples tried to cast a demon out of a man, and the demon or out of a young man. And the demon wouldn't leave. And they came to, to Jesus and said, hey, we brought him to your disciples. And the disciples couldn't cast him out. And Jesus talked to them about something totally different. And he told his disciples, this kind comes out by, only by prayer and fasting. You know what prayer and fasting does? It gives you authority. Because it draws you closer to God. We're going to talk more about what authority is, how to get authority in just a second. But we need to understand, power against power doesn't work. See, Satan had power. When he was removed from heaven, he never lost his power. He retained his power. But he lost authority. And we're going to tell you why that happened shortly. But he lost authority. And so we're trying to cast out something with power, and power doesn't remove it. Just like the disciples, they couldn't remove the demon because they tried to cast it out with power. And it's not power, it's authority. Authority is what removes the demon. And you don't have to yell. When you have authority, you don't have to yell. I used to, when I started out of ministry, I was in the deliverance ministry, and I thought you had to yell and spit for demons to come out. I now know that yelling does not make a demon come out. Authority does it. When you have authority, you walk into the room and the demon will come out. It is pure authority that allows or causes that to happen because they know that if you exercise that authority, they are doomed. They are doomed. But if you try to use power, they go, oh, I got power. You see, even Michael and Gabriel, when arguing about the body of Moses and Jude, when Jude writes about this, they, they, were, they were fighting until they said, oh, we're going power against power. It was a stalemate. Until they said, the Lord rebuke you. I call on the authority that I'm here by to rebuke you, Satan. And when they exercised the authority, they were given the body. Well, so often we try to implement the wrong thing. Trying to do the right thing, we implement the wrong thing. Here's some other distinctions between power and authority. Power is a gift. What does it say? You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. The day of Pentecost, they received power when the Holy Spirit came upon them. Power. It's a gift. And when you misuse it, you're called a dictator and a tyrant. See, you rule by authority, but when you try to rule by power, you cease being the authority and you become the dictator and the tyrant because you make people do something. But authority causes people to do something. People give you authority, you seize power. See, but authority is different than power. It doesn't, it's not a gift. Authority, you can't say, okay, give me the gift of authority. There is no gift of authority. There's a gift of power. But no gift of authority. You see, authority is bestowed upon you by the one who has authority. And it is, it's not only bestowed, it's only bestowed by proximity to the one who has authority. So the closer you get to the one that has authority, the more authority you have. Now, this is where it's important for you to understand because Satan had incredible authority before he fell. And by the way, Satan is not a name. Satan is a title. Lucifer is not a name. Lucifer is a title. God removed the angel's name. And he left him with a title. You want a title? You tried to rise above God and gain a title? I'll give you a title. You're now titled Satan. So it's technically the Satan, not Satan as a name. 
Satan, God totally removed his name. Nobody knows his name. You want a title? I'll give you a title. Satan. Ugh. <laughs> Satan in heaven had authority. He was the anointed cherub, had clothing of gold. He was the covering cherub, had nine precious stones all over this gold covering that he walked in. He was the, the head authority of all the sanctuaries of heaven, the Bible says. And yet he wanted more power, more authority. So when he fell, and it's important that we know that Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. When he fell, he was removed from proximity to God. He never lost his power because the gifts and callings of God are irrevocable. Power being a gift is irrevocable. And that's why you see people that have fallen in ministry still operating in some measure of power because it's irrevocable. But authority is not irrevocable. In fact, authority, the closer you are to God, the more you have it. But at the same time, the further away from God, the more you lose it. And Satan, when he was kicked out, started being further and further away from God. And the further away from God he was, the more authority he lost. Being cast down to earth, he lost a lot of authority, and therefore when he was on earth and he saw God give man authority over the earth, subdue and take dominion. Subdue, power, take dominion, authority. Told Adam and Eve, I want you to subdue the earth and take dominion over it. Use power and take dominion, use authority. And when he saw man had authority, in fact, man named every animal on the face of the earth. And that means he even named serpent, serpent. Because he had authority over that which he named. And so when Satan saw that man had authority, what did Satan want? Because he lost his authority. He wanted that authority. He had power, but he didn't have any authority. And so when he tempted Adam and Eve, he wasn't tempting Adam and Eve with greater power. He was tempting them so that he could get their authority. And he did. And so in Luke chapter 4, we find Satan taking Jesus up after his 40-day fast, taking Jesus up onto a high pinnacle and saying to him, showed him all the nations and kingdoms of the earth in, in one moment of time and said, see all of these and their authority. Didn't say, and their power. See all these cities and their authority. I will give it to you because it has been delivered to me. Who delivered it to him? Begins with an A. Adam and Eve, very good. The authority Adam and Eve walked in, they gave to Satan because now they submitted themselves to Satan as their God and not unto God being their God. Paul says, to whom you submit yourself to, you become the slave of the one that you submit to. Either sin leading to lawlessness or righteousness leading to greater righteousness, eternal life. And so they submitted lost their authority, gave their authority to Satan. Satan is now saying, see all this authority? It's mine. And he was just reminding Jesus, you may have taken it away from me when I fell, but I have legal right to it right now. It's been given to me legally, so you can't take it away from me. It's legally mine. Of course, Jesus was probably thinking, oh yeah? I have a plan you can't even imagine, Satan. So authority, authority is more important than power. I can hear you going, what? I'll, I'll say it again. Authority is more important than power. How do you know? Because the Bible tells me. Where does the Bible tell you that? How about Luke chapter 10, verse 19? Luke 10, 19 says this. Behold, I give you the authority exousia, to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power, dunamis, 
of the enemy. I give you authority that is greater than the power the enemy has. Authority is greater than power. However, due to mistranslations and inconsistent and inconsistent translations, we've lost the distinction between authority and power because it's it's mistranslated so often. The English Standard Version of the Bible that, is, that has come out by J.I. Packer in, instigated it along with Wayne Grudem and other, other men. Um, it does probably the most accurate job of interpreting these two words, but the King James and New King James, which is what I read from and study from, so I'm not like anti it, but it does not make the distinction between authority and power. It mistranslates exousia into power and dunamis into authority. It totally mistranslates it, and it doesn't do it consistently. It translates it right in one verse and translates it wrong in another verse. And here's a couple of, of instances. In Luke 10, 19, it says, Behold, I give unto you power in the New King James, but it's really the Greek word exousia, and it means authority, to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the dunamis of the enemy, power. I give you power to trample on the power. But it's not exactly what it says. It, it says, I give you exousia, authority to trample on the power. Another example, and these are just a few examples. There's lots of them. Matthew, Matthew 10, I'm sorry, Matthew 9, 6 through 8. But that you may know the Son of Man has power. But again, it's the Greek word exousia. It's really authority. The Son of Man has authority to forgive sins. Then he said to the paralytic, arise and take up your bed, go to your house. And he arose and departed to his house. Now when the multitude saw it, they marveled and glorified God who had given such power to men. But it's not, again, it's not power. It was exousia. He gave exousia, such authority to men. Why is that important? Because he wants to give authority to you. But if you try to use power to do what authority is supposed to do, you'll be nothing but a tyrant and a dictator. That's what Satan himself is, a tyrant and a dictator. If you operate on his ground, you will not remove him. But if you operate on the ground of the heaven and earth, then you will remove him. You cannot operate on Satan's ground. You cannot have a demon of lust and command a demon of lust to come out. You can't operate on his ground. You operate on the ground of heaven, not on the ground of, that the enemy has been given. Okay, casting out demons. Again, Matthew 10, 1, and when he called his 12 disciples to him, he gave them power. But it's really exousia, authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. It is the issue of authority. Again, the mistranslation. So, you have to look at the Greek word to find out exactly what it is. And again, the English Standard Version does a probably the best job of interpreting that, those passages. But how do we get authority? Now that we've kind of established that, how do you get authority? You, don't, you, can't, you can't like earn a gift because then it's a reward, then it's a salary, then it's, then it's something that you earned and you got, but a gift is just freely given to you. But authority comes by one way, and that's this. Yes, it is getting closer to God, but there's only one way you get closer to God. There's only one way. Yes, through Jesus, but there's this one way, and that is this. You have to be obedient to what he asks you to do. It is obedience. Obedience. Now, today, we talk about sin management, how can you manage your sin? The problem is, nowhere in the Bible is it ever taught that we should learn to manage our sin. We learn to eradicate our sin. We learn to cut off the head of the devil. We learn to cut off the head of the serpent. We don't like tame it. We learn to cope with it. We eradicate it. We want to totally disintegrate any hold it has on me, on you. We want to eradicate it. We don't want to, we don't want to make it a nice toy.
So you see, when you talk obedience, it means eradicating issues. Totally getting rid of issues. How can you, how can you expect something to obey you when you don't obey the higher authority than you? You see, you cannot cast demons out with authority when you have no authority because you don't obey who told you to do something. If God says, I want you to do this, and you say no, you can't tell the demon, I want you to do that because he'll just look at you and go, no. And that's what happened with the sons of Sceva. The sons of Sceva come marching into the room, and they say, come out. And the demon says, ha, ha, ha. Paul, I know. Jesus, I know. You, you're in trouble. <laughs> And naked, they ran out of that room. See, you cannot do anything unless you obey. And when you obey, you start having authority. Here's another thing that happens when you obey. As you obey, you get closer and closer to God. Now, there's a whole, the, the problem is this, is that we, our culture has taught us that really obedience, you can obey and everything should be fine. But here's, here's what our culture says. It's like the little boy who is standing up in his chair trying to eat breakfast. And his mother says, Johnny, sit down. Johnny says, no. His mother says, Johnny, sit down to eat your breakfast. Johnny goes, no. His mother says, Johnny, Sit down before I come over there and eat your breakfast. Johnny goes, no. Mother comes over, grabs Johnny, sits him down on the chair, says, now eat your breakfast. And Johnny looks at his mom and says, I may be sitting down on the outside. <laughs> but I'm standing up on the inside. That is not obedience. See, it is obedience, but it's not the obedience that God's looking for. See, the obedience God's looking for is what we probably would call submission. Now, the difference between obedience and submission is this. It involves attitude. Attitude. The little boy's attitude. He obeyed, but his attitude was not submissive. How does that apply to you? God says, I want you to give $100 in the offering. Oh, I rebuke this devil in the name of Jesus. I rebuke this. I was, that is the devil. I know that's the devil. And you, you know how I know that's the devil? Because if I give that $100, I won't have gas money for this week. So I know that's the devil. And the Lord says, give $100. But that's all I have in my pocket. Give the $100. But I won't have any gas. I know. Give the hundred dollars. But if I don't get to work, they'll fire me. Give the hundred dollars. But if I, I won't even have any food. Give the hundred dollars. So you reach in your pocket. Take it. That's giving. That's obedience. It is far from cheerful giving. <laughs> you see, it says God loves a cheerful giver, meaning submitted, because it involves your attitude, it involves your emotions. You see, when you understand if God says give the hundred dollars, then God can provide you with a hundred dollars. He can multiply the gas in your tank. He can create food out of a fish. I mean, he, whatever he wants to do, he can do. It's not hard for him. And if we truly understand that even if God says, give the $100 and I want you to fast this week, if it's more important to the kingdom for that $100 to go there, then it surely must be that important to you. And so we align our heart with the heart of God. That's what submission is. It's aligning our heart with the heart of God. And we do it gladly, knowing that God, as truly sovereign, can create, generate anything he wants to do. He can, he can have somebody walk up to me and give me another $100. He can have 10 people walk up to give me $10 each, and I can get the $100. And then, not to mention, say, you know what? You may have given the $100. I'm not going to give you $100. I'm just going to give you the power to raise the dead. How's that? 
You see, we have to understand the ways of God here. And the ways of God aren't always the way we think. Well, like nobody walked up and gave me the hundred dollars. Yes, but did you get a promotion? Well, yeah, I got a promotion. Were you expecting it? No, I wasn't really expecting it. Did you get a raise? Yeah, like twice my salary. And God said, oh, so nobody gave you a hundred dollars. See, we, we so disassociate God from our events in our life. You see, Jesus lived a life absolutely, totally, 100% obedient to the Father. It says this in Philippians 2. It says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the, being the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation taking on the form of a bondservant, coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. He says this, he did everything the Father asked him to do. Son, become a man. Yes. All right, Father. Humble yourself. Yes, Father. Take a physical body. Yes, Lord. I don't want you to look like God on earth. I want you to look like nobody knows your God on earth. Yes, Father. I want you to die for them, son. Yes, Father. You're going to endure agony. Yes, Father. Total, absolute obedience. And the result was found in the next verse, verse 9. Therefore, because he did all these things, therefore, God highly exalted him and gave him a name above every name that that every name in heaven and earth and beneath the earth should bow before him that is authority when we obey to the degree of our obedience becomes the degree of our authority no obedience no authority and when we're taught that authority and power are the same, then Satan can ride our backs like little backpacks, Klingons. When the Lord started working with me on this, and we started going out to some of the places that we go to, the pagan festivals, to evangelize there, and which areas to evangelize there, Salem, Massachusetts, and haunted happenings, all of a sudden, one year I go and nothing happens and everybody just kind of looking and just walking around. Next year I go and and because I've started to understand this, I start going, getting, uh, understanding, getting closer to the Lord, obedience, not arguing when God says to do something, absolutely obeying. Next year I go and people started hissing at me. And I go, this is good. <laughs> this is good. They know I'm here. I'm carrying something this year I did not carry last year. They recognize the power of God is here. And when the power, it's not me, John Paul Jackson, but he who is in me is not, they're not happy and they're terrifying. It's terrifying them. And they know they are about to lose. Now see, this, this is, this changes everything. Because we're, we're taught there's a, there's a whole teaching going on that's proliferating the church today. And it says, you don't have to worry about sin. God's grace covers it. But you see, I challenge you to show me any place in the Bible where it says grace covers sin. Well, you say, well, Paul says we're saved by grace. Yes, we're saved by grace, but it doesn't say it covers your sin. You see, grace, it says, gives you the strength to say yes to God and no to Satan. It's a strengthener, it is not a coverer. The only thing that covers your sin is the blood of Jesus. Only thing. And here's what happens. When we say grace covers our sin, we diminish the value of Jesus' blood and crucifixion. We diminish the value of his blood and his crucifixion. When we say grace covers, covers me. Because you know what? They had grace in the Old Testament. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. They had grace in the Old Testament. Read it. Look up the hundreds of references to grace in the Old Testament. So therefore, if grace was it, Jesus didn't need to come. It is the blood 
that covers sin. And it said it in the very beginning. What did God do with Adam and Eve? He slew an animal. What happened when he, sh- when he killed that animal? Blood was shed. When he put the garment, blood was shed to cover their sin. The body was sh- the flesh was shed to cover their flesh. It is the blood. We never diminish the blood. Never. If you diminish the blood, you play right into Satan's hands. It is the blood that makes atonement for the soul, the Bible says. Leviticus 17, 11. The blood makes atonement for the soul. You see, the, sin, the, the, the spirit never sins. Every sin is committed in the soul. Did you know that? Every sin that starts in the soul. And so authority comes by obedience, and obedience comes by, deepest obedience comes by saying yes with a heart of obedience, and this is what the Father wants, this is what I want. That gives you great authority. And when you have that kind, that kind of authority, then you take on the nature of Jesus. You see, you can't tell me you want to be like Jesus and not be obedient. Because his whole life was based on that obedience. Jesus had to humble himself twice. Once to redeem mankind and once to respond to the Father. By the time Jesus came into this world, he had so emptied himself of the glory and power and the status that he held in his divinity that no one recognized him as God. It took Peter a year, over a year, and that was through divine revelation to recognize he was the Son of God. And none of the spiritual leaders at the time recognized him as the Son of God. They treated him as a mere man who was threatening their power. So to take on the nature of Jesus is then to take on the obedience of his heart doing what God wants. And when you walk in obedience to God's heart, you'll have authority and demons will shriek when you come by. It says that Jesus became obedient, meaning in his human form, he was not born obedient. He became obedient. His soul screamed. But the father touched his spirit and said, no. Lord, not my will, but your will be done. Father, if it, my soul is exceedingly troubled. Again, every sin is in the soul. And he goes, my soul is exceedingly troubled. Father, my soul wants to rebel against you. But it is not my will, but your will be done. And then that process He passed the final test of obedience and was given a name above every name. See, it's hard for me to understand how it was important for Jesus to be obedient, but it's not important for us to be obedient. It was important for the Son of God to be obedient. But somehow we think he removed the need for us to be obedient. No wonder demons don't shriek when we walk by. They're disobedient just like us. I love the part in 1 Corinthians 10 where Paul is talking to the church in in Corinth and is telling them to cast down these arguments, these strongholds that they have. And the last part of that verse says this, and he is ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. In other words, God is waiting to act on your behalf until you're obedient. Because if he punished all disobedience before you're obedient, he would have to punish you too. So he waits for you to be obedient. So once you become obedient, then God says, now I will act on those who are disobedient. Because I'd really, in my mercy, I don't want to have to punish you right now. But if you want me to punish all disobedience, then I've got to punish you because you're not obedient. But when you become obedient, now I can punish 
disobedience. There's so many things God wants to do for us. When I'm standing in the throne room and I'm, I'm terrified out of my mind, you say, well, didn't you feel love? I said, yeah, I felt love because he didn't kill me. When you stand in front of all the creative power that ever existed, your thought isn't, oh, man, God is so much love. Your thought is, this power could change everything. If he has the wrong thought, I disappear. He didn't have to nod his head. He didn't have to speak the word. He didn't have to lift a little finger. He just thinks it, and I'm gone. It's a thought in God. Boom. And you're standing in front of him. Paul, Paul wrote this after his experience. He said, having known the terror of the Lord. See, sometimes we get to thinking that God is just love and nothing else. There is the side that scares you spitless. To put it in a common Waxahachie, Texas, where I was born, terminology. It scares you spitless. Your mouth dries up. You can't utter a word. You're just paralyzed. And God, in his majesty, I met him in his majesty. Oh, yeah, he is love. That's why we're still here. But we can walk into that. We can walk into a place in him where that, where that we walk into room and we can say, peace, and demons leave. You see, there's, there's this Hebrew word called shalom. And there's a Greek word, irene. Now, they mean basically the same thing, but it's even clearer in the Hebrew, the, Greek, the, the Hebrew word shalom. Shalom, technically, when Jesus, as a Jewish boy, when he stood up in the boat and said, peace be still, he wasn't speaking Greek. He was speaking Hebrew. And when he said, peace be still, he said, shalom, be still. That word shalom, we say, well, what does shalom mean? Shalom means peace. Well, yes and no. Technically, no. Shalom is one word that speaks of a process. And the process is this. When I say shalom to you, when Jesus said shalom, he is saying, may the anarchy and chaos that surrounds you be removed. And the result is calm and tranquility. So when he said shalom, he was saying chaos and anarchy be removed from the clouds, from the wind, from everything. And the result is calm and tranquility. Jesus said, when you come across somebody who accepts you, leave your peace with them, leave your shalom with them. In other words, when you come into a room, may all the... Chaos and anarchy run away because of your presence. And the result will be calm and tranquility. When you enter a room, things should become calmer. If you walk in authority. So you can't say shalom and have things change without authority. And obedience gives you authority. Submission gives you authority. When that began to dawn on me, that I could walk into a room full of sin and demons will go, they'll leave. And suddenly, peace comes into a chaotic environment. The problem is this, if I don't have peace, I will bring no peace. If I don't have shalom, I won't walk into an environment and demons flee. Chaos won't leave. Anarchy won't leave. I would say what's missing in America today is we don't have authority which creates an environment of peace. See, it's not just an environment of peace amongst demonic forces, but it will be amongst every ethnos, every ethnic group, every religion will be peace, and it will lead false religions to the true religion. 
Because they won't have peace when they walk into a room. When we have the peace of Jesus, we have the authority of Jesus walking in us. When we walk in, things become calm. Never do anything that takes away the calm. Never do anything that removes shalom. Never do anything that promotes anarchy. Never do anything that promotes chaos. Never do anything that takes away from the submission to our Heavenly Father that all of us submit to, whether we're white, black, yellow, whether we're Asian, Indian, Western India, Eastern Indian, whatever we are, never take away any of that. That's what the, what the enemy wants to do. That's what he wants to do. The greatest creativity, the greatest potting soil for creativity is peace. You will come up with inventions when you walk in peace. You will come up with solutions when you walk in peace. You will walk in wisdom when you walk in peace. And without it, there is no solution. There is no, there is no invention. So why do demons no longer shriek when we walk in? Probably because we have forgotten the value of relationship with the Father, which grants authority. If we could walk in authority, the authority of relationship with God, not false authority, not man's authority, but authority from heaven, there would be no problems in this, in this, this nation. Everything would work. Everything. The politics would work. Our judicial system would work. The legislative system would work. Everything would work. It wouldn't be an issue of Republican or Democrat or any other party. Everything would work. We need that to return. There's a low spiritual water table in America because there's a low table of spiritual authority in America. Low table of relationship with God in America. We need a relationship with him. And it will change everything. There's a couple here. One, two, three, four, five, six rows back. You have a, he, the husband, I believe, uh, has a purple shirt on. And the the wife, you got a, a, like a multi subdued colored blouse or something on your shoulders. Would you two stand up, please? You can just, yeah, just stay right there. Is this your children with you? How far over does it go? Like the whole row? (laughs) Two over? Uh, Here's why I had you stand up, because I see a light surrounding you. I see the presence of God surrounding you. And I see it on your children, too. In fact, I saw kind of the glow from it reaching to the people that aren't standing up right now. And So something, there's a connection between, between you. There's like some link or something. But I, I, I just want to say to you, brother, first of all to you, the, the husband, it's a miracle that you are alive today. It's only by God's hand that you're standing in this room today. Satan desired to sift you like wheat, as, as Jesus said to Peter. Even in the last year, The enemy has asked for your life. And God said, no. But, because the prayer of your grandmother has not yet been fulfilled. And so, you 
The prayer of your grandmother is yet ahead of you, and it will happen. And God's hand is upon you. He tells me to tell you the last 90 days has caught his attention because he's seen your heart. It's not like you were an evil man or anything, but he's seen your heart turn even more towards him. You've said yes in a couple of ways that made God smile. And, it, and he wants me to tell you, because of this, promotion is coming your way. <laughs> to the wife, the one who has all these mysterious knowings and feelings, that's you. Uh, yeah, oh, that, there you go. And you must have written some of them down or something. Uh, I know because you showed me it looked like a journal or something she's holding. A book, yeah, or something you write in. But uh, the Lord says for me to tell you, he has heard not just the prayer, he's heard your cry. He's heard your cry. And he said, two weeks ago, you were laying on your bed, weeping, and the Lord heard your cry. And he is going to answer your cry. It will happen. He wants me to tell you, it will happen. Then he wants me to tell you regarding your children. Leadership is being placed upon them both. And they will be mighty in the kingdom of God. Amen. So God bless all y'all. Amen. Bless you. Just for the, the, other, at the end of that row there, you know, that same row, the end of that row, I just want to tell you that I see the earth shaking beneath your feet. Something about uh, power and uh, authority and uh, worship and prayer. Power, authority, worship, and prayer. There's, there's dominion coming, coming your way. And... I see leadership also on the three of you. And it, it's like leadership that's uh, rallying. You're, there's something you're going to rally people to. You're going to rally people. And people are going to start gathering to, to a message or some, some rallying call that comes from a message that people are going to rally to, that you three are going to be involved in doing it. It's like I see you in the top, the top decision-making ethos of this, of this, this uh, coming purpose of God. So, so don't give up. I just hear, I keep hearing, tell them, don't give up, don't give up, don't give up. It may be difficult, don't give up. It, they may be betrayed, but don't give up. They may, people may, may leave, don't give up. It will change things. It's like the atmosphere will change because of you three. So blessings on, on you two. I just needed to share that with you. Over here, there's a, a, you got a green tie on. You got a mustache, you probably always wear that. But you got a green tie today, dark coat. I think your wife is sitting next to you. She's got the long, dark hair. She's got kind of a greenish, aqua green blouse. Would you two stand up? I believe you're married, because I think you, uh, your arm was around her earlier, so <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that means you're, you're married. The, I, I want to just say, a couple of things to you that I saw. One is, God's called you, so don't doubt that he has put, placed his call on you. Even though it hasn't worked out exactly like you thought, the calling is upon your life. There are, there is uh, kingdom, kingdom opportunities that lie ahead for you both. There is a strange combination of business and ministry that God has called the both of you to, that God is going to continue to breathe his breath upon it. And what you saw over a decade ago is going to take place. And there's also something to do with, I don't understand this, but it has something to do with health. And God is going to use you to bring health to people. Now, I don't know whether that's because of 
finances and you invest and you, you bring good food to people. I don't know whether that's because you, you make housing for people. I don't know. So I'm, I'm opening up the door for what that means. But health is going to be involved in what God has called the both of you to do. Then I want to say also, there's a reverberation of, in the spirit that is happening right now in your extended family. Don't give up on the change that you've been hoping would take place. It is going to take place. The, it's shaking, they're, and they're trying not to show the shaking, but it is shaking, and there is still hope. Not only hope, there should be, it should move from hope to expectation that, that it is going to change, and that will change the financial dynamics as well. So that's why I need to tell you blessings, blessings, blessings on the both of you. Amen. Amen. There's a man right back here. You've got your hand on your chin right now. Looks like maybe a tan colored shirt. Your left hand is there. Uh, would, would, you stand, would you stand up? I, I just need to share this with you. The, the scripture says, hope deferred makes the heart sick, but desire is a tree of life. You've, you've experienced um, hope deferred. But God is wanting you to know that he's creating this new desire that's starting to grow like a seed inside of you is going to become a tree of life, a tree of life. And I see, I see someone that's distant from you coming and hugging you and kissing you on the cheek and reconciliation being made. And I, I see... Um, I see like, it's like you're thinking an end of a road, but it's not the end of a road. There's not, the road is not, it's a mirage. What you're thinking is the end of a road is a mirage. It's not the end of the road. The road has a long, long way to go. And you're as if, it's as if you're in a desert place, but you don't know that just over the hill, you can't see the lush the lushness of the valley that you're coming to. And so um, there's all the upheaval that's been going on around you and uh, in other people that have affected you. They've other, it's almost like other people have had more upheaval, but the up, their upheaval impacts you. It has direct, it's like if somebody catches the flu, they, can, they infect you. It's, it's the upheaval around you that has impact on you. And God is going to start stabilizing the surrounding people groups around you, so start stabilizing them. And I hear, I hear um, the phrase, wind, the, wind of, of, uh, the wind of opportunity is about to blow right in your face, seize the moment. The wind of opportunity is about to blow in your face, seize the moment. So blessings, blessings, blessings on you, brother. Well, Father, thank you for these words, these prophetic words. I pray that they will find deep soil, not be plucked away or carried off or choked out, but that they will find deep soil. that your name will be made known and the wise will be confounded and the schemes the schemes that the man has set against your prophecies you by speaking them today may those schemes be dismantled and may your word come to pass for your glory, for your great name's sake, for the testimony of Jesus and the advancement of his kingdom, that it might be on earth as it is in heaven. For the glory of the Father, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.
was good. <laughs> I'm going to have to soak in some of that. <laughs> uh, I kept hearing the Lord say, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and I'll exalt you. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and I'll exalt you in due time. It's a broken and contrite heart that the Lord never forsakes. Amen? And I think that is truly the pathway that the Lord's calling us into, that we step under that authority of the Lord God, that he's wanting to dump that on us. I believe that. I, I, as, as John Paul Jackson last night shared some of those things to us, that he was that was on his heart and I, I just really I put my hands on my face thinking of the the journey that we've been on in the last year and the pieces that he keeps giving us glimpses of and that that was probably the best articulation of all the things that he's been speaking to us and what he's drawing us to because the Lord God wants to see us walking in authority making a difference and it begins in your home it begins in your home. You know, that was, I think, the first thing on my heart, Lord God. You know, and I will tell you, when I went into the ministry, I told, I told the Lord God, I can fail at everything, but I don't want to fail at being a daddy. I can fail at everything, but not being at a daddy. Because that, that word's got to be alive in my home. And we, we began families on the go with the putting on the armor. said, so get dressed together. Put on, on the armor. Because... It, he never told us to take it off. And it's in the context of our homes and our wives, our husbands and our children that we're supposed to be walking in that. That authority. Not seeing homes tore apart, but seeing homes strengthened. And seeing homes make a difference. Bringing in the prodigals. <laughs> Amen. I'm going to tell you, if we catch on to this, what he shared with us, that I believe, I, I, I do believe that. It's authority. I, I think the Lord gave me a glimpse of that at the first of the year in our praying. I, I, I don't know if my wife noticed, but as we pray, I just realized I can't, I can't do anything but in the, in the authority of my King Jesus. I ask you to do this, Lord God, by your authority. By your authority. If we will humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord, he will exalt us in due time. Well, everybody stand. Everybody stand. Lord, we just thank you so much for John Paul coming and sharing with us today. I know when this transition occurred, Jack Taylor, R.T. Kendall, and John Paul Jackson were the three relationships that I really saw connected to this church that I wanted to maintain and and I love so much his heart and his humility, his realness. And I do believe that it was ordained for him to be here today. And I believe that this word is a very vital word for this body. And I pray that you, uh, you know, don't walk out of this place just that we had a good meeting today. <laughs> walk out of this place taking what was shared today and figuring out what you got to do to get underneath that. Because we want to move forward. We want to see his kingdom come. Lord, we want to see your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We don't want to see people getting beat up and, and, and their lives ruined. We want to see, Father, victory rising up in people's lives. And we know, Father, it is by your authority. It is by your authority. We don't want to play church and we don't want to play a game, Father God. But we want to walk in the reality of you and the reality of your word. And Father, what we read in scripture, we want to see that evident in our own lives, Lord God. Not reading it as a history book, but it's reading it as something that's relevant for us right now, today. And so, Father, as we leave this place, Father, I know your word does not return void. It's what your word says. So as we leave this place, Father... I pray that you would just haunt us with some of these things. Keep it stirred inside of us, Lord God. We'd not let go, Father. I pray that we'd press into you closer and deeper than we ever have before. I pray as you're calling us as a church to be a praying church, Lord God, that we'd realize as we press into you in prayer and in knowing you deeper and deeper and closer and closer that you're going to impart that authority on us. 
and we will see demons flee. We'll see the healings taking place that we're so desperately crying out to you for. We'll see, Father, deliverance taking place. We'll see the, the dreams and ideas and the creativity that we keep praying for begin to explode in people coming out of your authority that you have bestowed upon us. We thank you, Father, for this day. We praise you and give you the glory for it. In Jesus' precious holy name. Thank you for being with us today. John Paul Jackson has a product table in the back if you're interested. Mm -hmm.